Okay, great. Uh, can you all hear me? Helmut, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, this still works. That's wonderful. So welcome everyone uh, to this afternoon's um, Distinguished Rothschild Lecture. It's uh, my great pleasure and honor to welcome and introduce Helmut Berskay, who is giving this Distinguished Lecture in our uh, Isaac Newton program on the mathematics of deep learning. Thank you so much, Helmut, for already returning to the INI uh, this, uh, um, uh, today for the second time, because this morning Helmut already gave another talk in our seminar series. So uh, before I hand over to Helmut, I would uh, just like to say a few words about Helmut and his uh, contributions to uh, the mathematics of data science uh, in general. So Helmut uh, Berska is professor in electrical engineering and mathematics at ETH in Zurich. In his research, he made fundamental contributions within the areas of information theory, mathematical signal processing, machine learning, and statistics. For his contributions, he, has, uh, he was awarded several prizes and honors, uh, really too many uh, to, to name them all. And actually, Helmut asked me to be a bit briefer uh, now. So just to name a few, Helmut uh, has been the recipient of the 2001 IEEE Signal Processing Society Young Author Best Paper Award, the 2006 IEEE Communication Society Leonard G. Abraham Best Paper Award, and he has been awarded with the ETH Golden Owl Teaching Award. He is a 2011 Eurosip Fellow, and he was a distinguished lecturer of the IEEE Information Theory Society from 2013 to 2014. He was also the recipient of an Erwin Schrödinger uh, Fellowship uh, from 1999 to 2001 of the Austrian National Science Foundation. And he was included in the 2014 Thomas Reuters list of highly cited researchers in computer science. He was an editor in chief for the IEEE Transactions and Information Theory, the TPC co chair of the 2008 IEEE International Symposium on Information Theory, and the 2016 IEEE Information Theory Workshop. And he served on the Board of, Con uh, of Governors of the IEEE Information Theory Society. So, as you can hear, Helmut is a very, very distinguished researcher, and it's really an honor. Uh, that he accepted our invitation to give this distinguished Rothschild lecture today on the mathematical universe behind deep neural networks. And I hand the word over to you now, Helmut. Thank you very much, Carola, for the most generous introduction. And welcome, everyone. Good afternoon and uh, good morning to those uh, in the US. Uh, it, it's a pleasure and an honor uh, to give this talk. And I'm deeply sorry uh, not to be able to be in Cambridge. Uh, I have tried, but uh, as you can guess, it's become very difficult. So what I would like to do uh, this afternoon is I would like to take you on a journey of stargazing. So we are going to gaze uh, at mathematical stars uh, in the context of deep learning. Uh, this is joint work with a number of people, Leandre Eberhardt, uh, Dennis Elbrechter, Philipp Gross, Rachel Gül, Clemens Hutter, Gitta, who is also here, Philipp Peterson. Mitro Perikostenko, Werner Vlacic, and Thomas Wiatowski, many of them my former students, postdocs, uh, collaborators. Uh, and I also got help uh, with slides from Recep uh, Gül, Dimitro, uh, Werner, and Thomas. All right, so I said I would try to get the audience to interact a little bit. So this is going to happen now. So if you um, uh, either use the chat uh, or uh, try to talk, I would like to start by reviewing some of the uh, applications that deep neural networks excel in. So let's try to start with classification. And uh, there is uh, here a classification task. Uh, there are four people that, uh, and we have uh, one, two, three images for each one of them. Can you help me? Uh, and uh, surely if a neural network can do that, uh, you can also do that and help me classify those people. Any suggestions? Just speak freely. There's nothing on the chat. You surely must recognize uh, some of them. Don't think mathematics only. 
All right, so I see something in the chat. John von Neumann, excellent. Thank you very much, Ira. Uh, De Herbert, funny, uh, thank you. Funny, you are out for the next task, okay. Uh, Herbert von Karajan. Uh, Kurt Gödel, Hans, thank you. Uh, and the last one, uh, this is for the Austrians. Uh, actually, no international, but uh, probably the Austrians will recognize. Who's the lady? That would be uh, Elina Garancia. Good. Uh, let's uh, move to the second task. So this is not for funny uh, for everyone else. Annotation of images. So you present a network with an image, and the network uh, comes up with a text describing the content of the image. Is there anyone who can help me annotate uh, this image? Ah, very good, Hans uh, Kleiber. Yes, so it's. Carlos Kleiber conducting the, so which orchestra? New Year's concert, yes. Uh, which orchestras? Well, uh, that's obvious, right? Uh, Vienna Philharmonic's New Year's concert. And now here is uh, for the aficionados. Uh, he conducted it twice. Uh, um, so of course I know if Charlie Gröchnig would be here. Uh, I think he actually succeeded in this task once before. Uh, does anybody know which year? Any guesses? All right, maybe funny. Funny, would you know? No, okay. Uh, not sure. All right, <laughs> good. So that would be 1989. Okay, let's uh, continue. So, what else? Uh, CNN's beat uh, the Go World Champion Lisa Doll in 2016. And then, just recently, I'm sure many of you uh, have read about uh, the tremendous success of uh, deep neural networks in protein folding, determining a protein shape from its amino acid sequence. So what I would like to do is uh, I would like to visit a few areas uh, of um, um, neural network theory and mathematics, and, and just we'll just gaze at the stars. We're not going to dive deeply into the technical details. I'll try to give some, but essentially try to tell the story. Uh, and uh, I would like to quote Ingrid Dobshi, who said that it's the guiding principle of many applied mathematicians that if something mathematical works really well, there must be a good underlying mathematical reason for it, and we ought to be able to understand it. Okay, so here is the definition of a neural network. Uh, it's essentially a concatenation of affine mappings and nonlinearities. So in um, each of those layers that you can see depicted on this picture, so you have inputs, those are input variables, four in this case. So in going from the green layer to the first blue layer, you perform an affine transformation, AX plus B, and then element-wise application of a nonlinearity. Um, and then in the end, you linearly combine uh, your uh, last layer outputs uh, to get the output of the network. So it's nothing but that, uh, a composition uh, of Ws, that, uh, which are affine transformations, uh, and rows, nonlinearities that act component-wise. So it's, of course, a highly nonlinear transformation. And I would like to uh, point out in terms of notation a few items. Uh, M is the uh, connectivity of the network, the total number of non-zero parameters uh, in those affine transformations. L is the depth, the total number of layers, and W is the width of the network. So it's the maximum of the number of nodes across all layers. So those are parameters that we will be using throughout the talk. And uh, here I think is a good place to, I have, two essentially guiding themes uh, or two things I would like to convey. First of all, this talk uh, in many respects is going to be about universality of neural networks, not only in the sense uh, of Hornick and Sibenko, as I will review in a second, but you will see universality in very different guises. And uh, what is the, the mathematical reason for these uh, strong universality properties uh, is the compositional structure. So classically, we have been working a lot, especially in approximation theory, harmonic analysis, with um, dictionary representation. We try to represent a function as a linear combination of dictionary elements. This is a very different structure here. It's a compositional structure. I see a question in the chat. Uh, Yuri, are the slides frozen? No, maybe I just spoke too long about this slide. Uh, can you see the next slide? Komogor of Donohoe University. Yes, okay. thank, you. thank you. All right, good. Okay, so here is the first topic I want to cover. Um, fundamental limits of deep neural network learning. Now, what uh, we can ask ourselves is the following. Uh, 
what is it that we can do at best uh, with a deep neural network in terms of uh, which function classes are learnable at all? If we ignore um, the fact that we have to have a learning algorithm, and if we assume that we have full knowledge of the function to be learned. So of course, uh, we are shaving off two of the major challenges in neural network theory. We just want to try to understand uh, what is possible. So this is, if you like, uh, an information theoretic view. What are the fundamental limits in representing functional relationships through this compositional structure? And uh, the uh, 1989 um, seminal paper by Hornick uh, and independently and at exactly the same time by Sibenko told us that uh, a single hidden layer neural network. So if you remember the picture with an input layer, then there's one hidden i.e. blue layer and the output layer. So if you just have one hidden layer, they showed that essentially every continuous function can be represented uh, as a neural network uh, uh, to within arbitrary accuracy. It's uh, a, um, not a quantitative result, so there's no bound in the number of nodes that you need. So this line of work came later. Andrew Barron was one of the uh, pioneers in this area. And there's some more recent work uh, also along those lines, um, no bound on depths and so on. So the point I'm trying to make here is that most of these results are not uh, quantitative. So the question is, uh, can we develop a systematic framework? Uh, can we be quantitative? And can we say something about the complexity of the approximating networks as a function of the complexity of the hypothesis or the function class that we want to approximate? And the answer will be yes. And we're going to use Kolmogorov, Tikomirov metric entropy, uh, and the framework that was uh, developed by David Donahoe in the late, uh, no, in the early 1990s. So uh, deep networks, that's the first thing I would like to show, uh, provide exponential approximation accuracy for a wide range of functions. So, uh, okay, it looks like there is a piece of another slide hiding the current slide. Is that the case? Or Carola, can you see the slide well? The slide well. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, all right, so maybe not anymore, but it was for a moment. Okay, good. All right, uh, so let's start. Um, one of the simplest functions you can think of is the squaring function. Can this compositional structure approximate the squaring function? Uh, and if yes, how complex does the network have to be? And uh, so here is a a uh, beautiful result by Dmitry Yarotsky that really started off uh, much uh, of the work that uh, uh, happened in approximation theory in neural networks, who showed that the squaring function can indeed be represented through this compositional structure uh, with the finite width network uh, and uh, the, uh, the depth of the network scaling uh, like logarithm in one over the approximation error. Now, uh, if you take it from here and uh, you say, well, and I will show you on the next slide, some kind of algebra, how you can generate uh, based on the uh, squaring function and the multiplication function, all sorts of functions. But the, uh, the basic uh, statement I wanna convey here is that if you have a finite width network with depth scaling polar logarithmic in one over epsilon, then it turns out that uh, the, uh, the connectivity of the network is upper bounded by the number of layers times w squared plus w, w is the width. So in each layer, we have an affine transformation. The size is at most number of non-zero entries and the matrix is at most w squared. Matrices are at most w by w plus w for the bias vector. If you rewrite this and you replace w by a constant and l by log one over epsilon, you see that the approximation error decays exponentially uh, in the connectivity. So individual functions can be at least a squaring function can be represented uh, in this compositional structure uh, with an error that decays exponentially in the number of real value parameters in the network. Uh, how do we go from the squaring function to more general functions? Well, you build the uh, multiplication function uh, by uh, realizing that xy can be written uh, in the form as displayed here. Now, x plus y, a linear combination, this you can easily realize through a neural network. It's an affine transformation. And then you already have the squaring network. Uh, and then you have uh, the difference of three squares, which is a linear combination of outputs of squaring networks. You put those networks in parallel and you get the multiplication function. And you, I'm sure, get the idea already. Once you have the squaring function, you have the multiplication function. You can realize uh, polynomials. 
Um, and uh, if you have uh, polynomials, you get the stone Weierstrass continuous functions. And uh, you can also realize uh, oscillatory functions through Yarotsky's sawtooth construction, which I'm not reviewing here, but you can do Fourier series, uh, etc. And then uh, you take it from there. So that's the neural network uh, algebra uh, that allows us to realize individual functions with exponential error decay. Now, uh, function classes. If you try to learn uh, from a hypothesis class, you have a whole class of functions. And the question is how well do neural networks do in terms of learning functions from the function class? So the function class for us is going to be uh, a compact set C for in some ambient space. This could be a bit of space. It could be a fighting a Grochenic modulation space. It could be a Sobolev space, smooth functions, whatever you have it. How does the complexity uh, of a network approximating all elements uh, from this set C scale or, or behave uh, as a function uh, of the complexity of the function class. Uh, so how, how do these two complexities relate to each other? In order to uh, be able to answer that, we uh, are going to quantize our networks. What we mean by quantize is that the weights are no longer uh, going to be real numbers. They are going to be taken from a finite set uh, so that we can represent them with finitely many bits. So the bottom line is, we are trying to see whether there is something hidden in each real number being representable by infinitely many bits, uh, and, and the answer will be no. So we want to be very concrete, and we have a certain bit budget for each of those real numbers. That will allow us to uh, describe the network as a bit string, a uniquely decodable, uh, one part encodes the topology, so where the connections are in the network, the non-zero weights, and the other part encodes the quantized weights. And uh, the statement uh, that uh, I want to make here is that deep neural networks are actually universal kolmogorov donohoe optimal approximators. What I mean by that is that, as I just said, we view the network uh, as encoding a function. Different topologies and different quantized weights correspond to different input-output relations, and these different input-output relations correspond to different functions. So the question is, um, what are the coverings that we can construct with deep neural networks? Uh, and uh, are they optimal in the kolmogorov tikomirov sense? Uh, or if not, how far away are they? Um, and uh, can we construct uh, uh, or get optimality for a given function class, for more function classes? And the answer will actually be for anything uh, out there you can possibly uh, imagine. Um, let me briefly say that uh, we care about the number of uh, bits that uh, we need to describe a neural network that represents or approximates a given function from within a function class to within an error epsilon. Uh, and so this exponent gamma here, you can think of it uh, as quantifying the description complexity of the function class. If uh, gamma star of C is larger, then you have a smaller growth rate uh, and smaller memory requirements. So large gamma is Good, uh, but it won't play too much of a role. I just wanted to raise awareness for the importance of this exponent. And uh, those of you who work with metric entropy will see that uh, it's related to Kolmogorov's uh, optimal exponents. And you see here this order epsilon to the minus one over gamma. So you will recognize this from metric entropy theory. Good, so classically uh, we approximate functions from function classes as linear combinations of dictionary elements, wavelets, uh, while Heisenberg frames, uh, local cosine basis, uh, Fourier basis, uh, whatever you have it. Never mind all the clutter on this slide. This is just uh, to uh, define that classically what we do is uh, we have a dictionary. We say we have M dictionary elements and we want to represent our function as a linear combination of those M dictionary elements. We allow the uh, dictionary to be um, uh, infinitely large. However, we have a constraint on how deep we can search into the dictionary. This is this pi of m, a polynomial depth search constraint. I don't want to spend more time on this. And the, the coefficients are quantized. So we encode uh, the function f by encoding in binary format the indices of the participating functions in the dictionary, the participating wavelet elements, uh, and uh, the uh, coefficient ci that are quantized. And because they are quantized, we can represent them uh, in bit strings. Okay, so what are uh, the limits uh, on that? So gamma star effective of C comedy tells you how well you can represent a given function class C 
in a given dictionary D. Um, now, this uh, exponent is going to be upper bounded by the Kolmogorov exponent, so you cannot beat uh, uh, the metric entropy limit. So Kolmogorov tells you what the minimal covering is. You cannot exceed that minimal covering. What is interesting, though, is to find out which pairs C and D uh, achieve Kolmogorov optimality. So in other words, um, if we want to know for a given function class, what are good pairs uh, or good dictionaries that allow us with what is called best M term representation to uh, get Kolmogorov optimality. The following incomplete table gives you an idea. So for example, you have a bed of space. So these are all unit balls uh, in the ambient spaces. Bed of space wavelets have long been known to be optimal. And on the right-hand side, you see gamma star of C, uh, which is S. Now in square brackets, uh, just to make the case that the dictionary matters, if you use a Fourier dictionary, in a base of ambient space. The base of ambient space somehow has uh, the structure of the affine group. If you use a Fourier dictionary, which has the structure of the Val Heisenberg group, you're going to get an exponent that is strictly smaller, namely S minus one half. If you use uh, a fighting agrochemic modulation space, then the optimal dictionary are local cosine bases or Wilson bases, uh, and you get uh, this gamma star of C as one minus half, uh, minus one half, sorry, plus one over P. Uh, and then you see all sorts of other spaces. Uh, I think the key message here is simply to convey that given a function class, you should actually know something about its structural properties. Then you can pick a dictionary. And if you make a wrong pick, uh, you won't be able to get uh, Kolmogorov optimality. So this is a, a, a big field. Uh, much has been published and studied in terms of what are optimal pairings. But the bottom line is you have to make a pick and you have to know something about your hypothesis class. Now, often in practice, uh, this knowledge is difficult to come by. And so the question is now, uh, can we do something smarter with neural networks or how would we think about approximation neural network theory in general? So what uh, we do is we replace this idea of best M term approximation by best M weight approximation. So we allow M non-zero weights in the network. We uh, interpret the, the neural network as an encoder uh, and evaluate it in the kolmogorov donahoe framework. And as already mentioned, you need to encode the topology and the quantized weights. And the question is, how many bits do you need relative to the Kolmogorov limit? Um, and the answer uh, is, is given by defining this formal concept of effective best M weight approximation. It again, never mind the details. It's like before in dictionary approximation, but now the number of dictionary elements is replaced by the number of connections that are present uh, in the network or the number uh, of weights. Uh, and well, uh, you see here that uh, now, if you look at the, the serum statement here, that we have gamma neural network star effective of C. So this used to be gamma uh, of uh, C comma D. So for a given function class C, there was a dictionary D and this gamma star uh, effective of C comma D told us how well they fit together. Now, just think uh, in terms of the following replacement, the dictionary is replaced by the neural network. And there's only one structure, it's the neural network structure. We're no longer going to try to match the dictionary to the function class. We work with a given function class C and we have neural networks and we train them and we have a genie based training algorithm. We have all the data in the world. And the question is, for which function classes C can neural networks achieve the Kolmogorov limit? And uh, in, as a byproduct in answering this, you also actually get the result that tells you that if you want a neural network that achieves an epsilon uh, worst case approximation error within your hypothesis class, then the connectivity has to grow at least according to what is here at the bottom of this slide. So you cannot beat the Kolmogorov limit. That gives you an idea of how large your network has to be so as to stand a chance to get an epsilon approximation error. Anyways, but the key question is, what are good function classes that are matched to neural networks? Uh, and the answer is, all of these function classes that you have seen before are universally, optimally uh, approximated by neural networks. So in other words, uh, the task of understanding something about your hypothesis class and choosing the matching dictionary is no longer an issue. You train your neural network. If you train it well, if you have enough data, you in principle can achieve Kolmogorov optimality for uh, all these uh, function classes here. 
uh, and, and many more. So uh, this is just a small sample. And what is remarkable here is, as I mentioned before, so base of spaces wavelets uh, have the affine group underlying, modulation spaces uh, have Val Heisenberg group underlying. So these are two very different group structures. And you can see how the affine uh, group structure is somehow a good fit for neural networks because we have affine transformations followed by nonlinearities, et cetera. But the Val Heisenberg group structure, time shifts and frequency shifts, this is much less clear that you can also optimally realize this with a neural network. All right, uh, now, can we do something with neural networks that uh, you can't do classically, or at least that was not uh, uh, known yet uh, how it could be done? And uh, here we picked uh, uh, two examples, uh, oscillatory textures, according to uh, Laurent de Manet from MIT, and uh, the Weierstrass function, continuous everywhere, differentiable nowhere. So these functions are known to be very hard to approximate, and the best uh, methods to date were of um, uh, polynomial accuracy. So no methods were known that achieve exponential accuracy. Now, for those of you who work with fractals, you will probably see, well, if you have a fractal generated by an iterated function set, so you have uh, an affine transformation like the counter middle third set, you have one third x as one function and two thirds plus one third x as the other function, and you keep composing these functions. Now, the, if you have a real nonlinearity, it can realize the identity mapping very easily as rho of x minus rho of minus x. So you can see how iterated function systems can be realized well with neural networks. But anyways, uh, the result that you get is that deep neural networks approximate oscillatory textures and the Weierstrass function with exponential accuracy. Um, and uh, the, uh, the latter result was extended later to more general fractals, namely those of um, iterated function uh, system type by Dobshide, Vohr, uh, and Hanin. So that brings us to the end of the first part of the talk. And let me briefly um, summarize which mathematical stars uh, we gazed at. We didn't visit them uh, and look at them in detail. So it was approximation theory, functional analysis, abstract harmonic analysis, frame theory, fractals, uh, and uh, metric entropy. I would like to switch gears and talk now about uh, a different neural network structure and a different application, namely uh, feature extraction. So very often neural networks are used as the first step in a classification uh, procedure. So you try to extract relevant features from images, from speech, from audio signals, and then try to classify your underlying images or whatever you have it based on those features. Um, and uh, the, the question is, why would we want to uh, do that? And why would we want to have nonlinear feature extractors? Well, if you have these two categories of points, blue and red, and uh, you're given the task of classifying them through a linear classifier, essentially a hyperplane that you can have passed through the origin or with an offset somewhere. So a line here, of course, that is not possible. However, uh, if you apply a feature extraction, meaning you transform your points, which we call F, uh, by uh, mapping them according to the norm of F1. So the norm of F, I mean, you just look at the radius of these two circles here. And then you get all the blue points to map to this blue point and all the red points to map to this red point. And uh, this is actually very easily linearly separable. Now, what I would like to, uh, uh, I would like to have you look at this in terms of invariances. Why? If you look at all the blue points and all the red points, what we have here is an invariance with respect to rotations. Now, in practice, often uh, invariances are so phi is invariant to the angular component of the data. Uh, in practice, invariances are often in, in uh, neural network theory or machine learning in terms of uh, shifts. Uh, and uh, I will be more specific about it later. So if you have a handwritten image recognition, if you write a three at the top left uh, of your page or at the bottom right, it shouldn't matter, right? So you should have translation invariance. That's why invariances are important. Now, uh, a second item of importance here is we want to have a trivial null set. So we don't want any features to map to the null function. Um, so there's a question here. Uh, in which norms is this exponential approximation? 
uh, so there's, uh, I mean, L affinity, L, L2, there is all sorts of results and the hornick sibenko theorem has been extended uh, by people to all sorts of different norms, etc. So I'll be happy to send you references uh, offline. Good. So you don't want to uh, have a, a function f mapping to zero through feature extraction because you will lose uh, those uh, features and they won't be uh, classifiable. All right. So um here is uh, this issue of invariance uh, and covariance so i mentioned uh, that uh, we have angular rotation or rotation invariance before i mentioned uh, handwritten image recognition or digit recognition the three it shouldn't matter where you shift it in your image but invariance is not the only thing in feature extraction sometimes you want to have covariance why well if you do face recognition uh, it turns out that the distance between the eyes and the nose and the mouse is actually a very important feature that helps you um, recognize uh, images. So you want to preserve distances and you want your feature extractor to tell you something about the relative distances of certain features. So we have both invariance uh, and covariance towards shifts, for example. So if you uh, continue, then you want a certain uh, deformation sensitivity or robustness. You have a picture here of what is likely uh, the most famous Swiss mountain. And uh, if you take the picture with an older or newer camera, there's uh, certain deformations. So you would like to have certain robustness. And clearly, if you look at these two pictures, I'm sure all of you will recognize the Matterhorn uh, on both pictures, also on the right-hand side. Good, so in summary, uh, we have, um, invariance, covariance. We have uh, this uh, null set property. I call it null set because it's not linear transformations. Uh, we have this deformation insensitivity. And uh, these are the issues that we expect from our feature extractors. And once you have extracted your features, you pass them into, let's say, a support vector machine and you perform classification. So now what is the uh, network structure I would like to uh, uh, tell you about. It's uh, known under the name of scattering networks, uh, pioneered by Stefan Mala in 2012, who had the following idea. He said, well, let's have an input signal F. Let's um, use a wavelet transform. So the G's here are wavelets, or you have a mother wavelet and you have different time shifts and scalings. Uh, and let's actually convolve F uh, with a wavelet function. Let's apply a specific nonlinearity, namely the magnitude function. And then uh, we take uh, at each node uh, the resulting signal and we filter it by a low pass like filter. And uh, these wavelet filters and the, the chi's, the low pass filters, they together form a, what is called a multi resolution analysis. Um, uh, later, this was generalized the structure to arbitrary frames. Uh, so you can replace the wavelet by other structures. The idea being again that other structures like Van Heisenberg. Mm -hmm. Ridgelets, shearlets would be uh, better suited uh, to other classification tasks. And uh, the question uh, that uh, we want to ask is the following. For the mapping that maps the input signal F to the feature vector, which is uh, the output of all of these nodes passed through uh, filters, and these filters can be general. So what we are doing now here is we are trying to make the structure as general as possible while preserving the tree structure. So you have convolution, the nonlinearity need not be a magnitude, uh, the filters need not be wavelets, and the chi's need not be low pass filters. So the idea is that we have a certain a modicum of uh, freedom here, and uh, but yet we want uh, uh, a prescribed structure, this tree structure, so that we can see my train this network by picking the right filters, the right nonlinearities, and there's also what is called pooling. Pooling operations are essentially averaging uh, or subsampling. And uh, the second result I would like to uh, present here is, uh, or, or the second statement I want to make is that uh, it turns out that general scattering networks, so meaning no matter which filters you use here, which frames you use here, um, which nonlinearities, as long as they satisfy certain minimal properties, which pooling operators you use it turns out that you can show that all these four desirable properties that I mentioned, namely translation invariance, uh, covariance, small deformation sensitivity, and the trivial null set, set, sorry, they all hold irrespectively of the filters, nonlinearities, and pooling operations. 
you apply as long as your set of filters forms what is called the frame. Your nonlinearities are Lipschitz and your pooling operators are uh, Lipschitz. And it turns out that the invariance that you get is something that is actually obtained by making the network deep. Namely, we call this vertical translation variance. If you go deeper into the network, your features become more and more translation variant. Closer to the root, the features are more covariant. And it indeed turns out if your task is image recognition, then the features closer to the root will be more important. Uh, and uh, the, the classification algorithm will actually work with those features. And if you want something where invariance is uh, important, then the features uh, closer to the bottom are going to be uh, important. Uh, and to get all these results, I don't want to go into all those details. All you need is uh, your filters, your Gs, uh, and your chi to form uh, what is called a semi-discrete frame. And uh, the, uh, uh, th these filters can be structured. They can be unstructured, learned, unlearned, uh, randomly picked. Uh, whatever you have it. The nonlinearities uh, are pointless nonlinearities. They should be Lipschitz. Um, this is satisfied by virtually all nonlinearities that uh, are used in the deep learning literature. And the pooling operation, averaging, subsampling, and so on, should also be uh, satisfying certain minimal properties. In this case, it's, there's also Lipschitz continuity involved. And then you get this uh, deep translation invariance. And so closer to root covariant, further down you get invariance. Okay, um, now trivial null set. Uh, yes, you can get it. For the uh, those of you who work with frame theory, you know that the frame lower bound guarantees you uh, a trivial null space of uh, your uh, mapping, your operator that you use to map the signals to the frame coefficients. But here we have something nonlinear. So what is interesting is that it turns out that if your nonlinearities and your pooling operators are Lipschitz and you use a frame in every layer of the network, and by the way, the frames you use in the different layers can be different, that is sufficient to get an overall energy conservation property. So phi of f is this feature extractor, the mapping from the input f to the feature vector. And uh, you simply go through the network, you pick up all the lower and the upper frame bounds and uh, you take the min and the max respectively, and that gives you an overall relationship that looks like a frame double inequality, but it's not because it's a nonlinear transformation. In particular, if you use Parseval frames, these are or tight frames in every layer, then you actually get full energy conservation, although this is a highly nonlinear transformation. And as a byproduct, you are guaranteed this trivial uh, null set property. Okay. So what were the uh, stars that we gazed at uh, in the course uh, of this part of the talk? Function analysis, harmonic analysis, frame theory, operator theory, differentiable manifolds, and Sobolev spaces. You will have realized by now that I have some favorite stars that I, I keep visiting. Of course, uh, this is uh, owing uh, to my technical background. But uh, I'm going to try to move to a different part of the universe now and look at universal probability distribution generation. So I apologize to those of you who attended my talk in the morning for the repetition. Um, what uh, we would like to look at here is, uh, in a sense, the reverse task to this, uh, you remember this picture of Carlos Kleiber where uh, I claimed the neural network can annotate the image. Now the reverse task is actually generation of information. If you look at this picture here, you see uh, images generated by deep neural networks. Uh, these are not real people. These are images that were generated based on trained neural networks. Um, there are other things you can do. So that's the uh, uh, actually the inverse operation to, to the Kleiber picture. You give the, the network a text. The small bird has a red hat with feathers that fade from red to gray, from head to tail, and out come these beautiful pictures here of indeed uh, birds that fit this description. Uh, and then there's a photo in painting that you can do with so-called generative context encoders. And there's many applications of generative neural networks. So the question that we wanted to ask ourselves was, if you have such a generative neural network with a very low dimensional input and a high dimensional output, why low in and uh, high out? Simply because often in practice, like uh, in natural language processing, this is what you get. The input of the network is determined by the dimension of what is called the word embedding and mapping from words to uh, vectors in Euclidean space. This would be a dimension of 100. 
uh, and the output layer represents a vector of probabilities for each of the words in the vocabulary, typically about 100,000. Moreover, if you have uh, a low dimensional input, high dimensional output, if you can keep the network small, meaning a low dimensional input, you get a more parsimonious network and this will require less training, et cetera. And we wanna understand what is possible at all. So here's the task, concrete. You have a uniformly distributed random variable on the interval zero one. You pass it through a neural network uh, with one input and two outputs, and you specify a target distribution. Um, can you realize every target distribution with a neural network? And if so, at what cost? How complex do networks have to be? And again, you will realize that there is something related to metric entropy involved. Um, and uh, the answer is uh, indeed, um, you can show that any target distribution you can realize with a deep neural network. And in most cases, uh, you actually do get this with a neural network of minimal size in the sense of uh, metric entropy, if you try to cover the space of uh, probability measures that you're interested in. Um, the way we do this is we first realize that if you push forward a uh, U01 random variable through uh, a ReLU network, then you have a piecewise linear function that is realized by the network and uh, you get the histogram distribution as the output. So ReLU networks cannot be expected to realize anything beyond histogram distributions, but I'm sure you've already seen the idea. You go now and take your histogram bin size to be small enough and uh, you get to your target distribution. What is interesting here is I marked uh, this first step here as dimensionality increase. You actually want to go from 1D to 2D and you have one random variable uniformly distributed and you want to generate any target distribution. Question, can you extract enough randomness out of this uh, single random variable to generate any D-dimensional target distribution? Uh, answer, yes. And the way you can think about it is you think about the binary representation of a U01 random variable, you realize that all the bits are uh, independent, they are identically distributed, uh, and then you just take every other bit for the first component uh, and the other bits in between for the second component, and you have uh, two independent components. So that's a, you know, a very simplistic way of looking at this. And just to tell you that there are space filling curves involved here, very special space filling curves, coming out of what I call the Yarotsky construction, a uh, railo network that realizes a triangular function and that you keep composing with itself. And what you need to do is if you take the network uh, to uh, get deep, then um, these, uh, the Sawtooth function here becomes uh, tighter and tighter. And eventually you're going to fill the entire two-dimensional chart here. Uh, and uh, what you do is if you push forward uh, single random variables through this network, according to the mapping on top here, so X is the input, uh, U01, GS of X is this function here, it turns out that uh, you can actually get uh, this uh, optimal approximation. And uh, it works because uh, this Yarotsky construction has the space filling property. Okay, and then you have to be a bit more, I mean, you have to adjust what we call the paint plan and so on. So I don't wanna talk about this. There's a few more technical issues. The main result here is that fix your target distribution new. There exists a network, in fact, with quantized weights um, of a certain uh, number of uh, non-zero weights, a certain depth, such that the Wasserstein distance between your target distribution and whatever the network produces is upper bounded by a sum of three terms. The first term comes uh, from the dimensionality increase that you have to uh, conduct. So S uh, is proportional to the depth of the network. If you take the network to get uh, deep, then this first term can be made arbitrarily small. The second term comes from the histogram distribution approximating the target distribution. Take the number of bins large, then this term goes to zero. And the third term comes from the fact that we work with networks with quantized weights. Again, because we want to understand how complex these networks uh, have to be. And so if you choose the quantization level to be one over number of uh, bins squared, then you can uh, drive the third term to zero as well. And you have your universal representation result. Now, uh, the main conceptual insight here is the following. You can say, well, if I want a D-dimensional target distribution and I have uh, D um, uniformly distributed random variables, why not just apply the proper function to push forward and, and get my target distribution. But you would have uh, a lot of randomness in the input, namely D, 
Uh, and the question that we asked is we want small inputs, we want small networks. And it turns out that if you use a one dimensional input, uh, this doesn't come at the cost in terms of Wasserstein distance relative to generating the target distribution out of the independent random variables. So you're not going to be penalized provided you take the network to be deep. And uh, to wrap this up, um, I don't want to go into the details and again, forget the clutter here. What is the statement on this slide? If your target distributions are histogram distributions, then you can do all this uh, Kolmogorov metric uh, entropy optimally. Uh, and for more general distributions, uh, you can do well, but we don't know whether it's optimal. But the bottom line is the network encodes the probability distribution. How? Well, it's driven by uniform input, zero, one, and uh, different topologies and different quantized weights generate different probability distributions. Those probability distributions are going to cover the space of probability distributions. And this covering is actually Kolmogorov optimal that you get. So let me um, review the stars that we have visited here. Probability theory, rate distortion theory, quantization theory, approximation theory, and the theory of optimal transport. So um, the topic before the last, uh, dynamical system learning. Um, now, what are the fundamental limits in learning uh, linear dynamical systems? What we mean by linear dynamical system is actually the following. Think about a linear shift invariant system or think about a linear time varying system. Or if you like, uh, even more abstractly, think about a linear operator. Um, can we learn linear operators? And I would like to emphasize that uh, this is not learning. Uh, sorry, can we learn linear operators, i.e. can we learn uh, PDEs, for example? So there's this class of pseudo differential operators. Uh, and then uh, the question is, can we learn those operators or the corresponding PDEs? We are not trying to learn the solutions uh, of the differential equations. We are trying to learn the differential equation itself. So for example, for the electrical engineers, if you have an LTI system, can you learn or identify the LTI system from input output traces? So you have input signals that you know, you observe the output, you do this sufficiently often, question, can you identify the system to within a prescribed accuracy? So what we are going to show is that indeed this is possible for a very general class of systems and optimally so. And uh, we're going to use a representation result uh, from uh, a harmonic analysis uh, that uh, you can find, for example, in Charlie Gröchenick's uh, wonderful 2001 book on time frequency analysis. So you can write every decent, I put here, I don't want to go into details, linear operator as a weighted superposition of time and frequency shifted versions of the input. And this weighting function is called the spreading function. And the network structure we're going to use now, because we're dealing with systems and they have sequences as inputs and outputs, is that of a recurrent or a feedback neural network. So here is uh, the formalization. And the first main result I would like to convey here is that every decent linear operator can be realized exactly with a recurrent neural network. And the way this is uh, established, this result is you use this representation here. Time shifts, I mean, you, I'm sure you see very easily how this can be done, uh, but also frequency shifts can be optimally realized with a recurrent neural network. And then if you put everything together, that's how you get this universal realization result. The question is now, can we be more quantitative? And the answer is yes. Uh, and here I would like to make uh, explicit the connection to uh, differential equations. And I would like to do it for the simplest possible case. Namely, the systems we look at are linear shift invariant systems. So here are the difference equations, linear difference equations with constant coefficients. And uh, those correspond to linear shift invariant systems with uh, rational transfer functions. And uh, well, we know already from the result that I just mentioned that they can be realized, these transfer functions, exactly with recurrent neural networks. It turns out, however, that this quantitative aspect, namely how many questions do you have to ask for, of the system, meaning how many input output traces and how accurate do those input output traces have to be to get to learn the system to within an error epsilon. Uh, and it turns out that. Uh, for uh, linear difference equations, uh, recurrent neural networks actually uh, solve the system identification task in a metric entropy optimal manner. So there is work uh, from control theory by George Samuels from the 1990s 
that uh, we built on. If you don't know these papers, I, I highly recommend them. It's wonderful reading. Okay, good. So let me summarize the, uh, the stars that we visited here, PDE theory, uh, the theory of underspread operators uh, as put forward by Charles Pfefferman in the uh, early 1980s, operator theory, metric entropy, hardy spaces feature here. And uh, I can, of course, not conclude without visiting the complex analysis star. I guess that would be a disappointment. So let me uh, uh, have as a last topic something that has little to do with universality, if at all, but touches upon a very basic question and then leads us uh, to complex analysis and many other beautiful theories, namely uh, neural network identifiability. What we mean by that is that if you're given a function and you realize it's through a neural network, um, the mapping from the function to the neural network architecture, uh, is it unique uh, and uh, under what conditions is it unique or if not, how big is uh, the source of non-uniqueness, what can we say about this? So there was, uh, uh, we are going to do this actually for the 10H nonlinearity, and there was uh, a paper in 1994 by Charles Pfefferman, uh, who established uh, under a set of conditions, I believe it was eight, uh, we call them genericity conditions, that neural networks and one and N2 that uh, have the same input output relation and are based on the 10 H linearity, um, they dissatisfy, they are um, identical, the input output relations, if and only if one network can be obtained from the other one by a series of sign flips. What I mean by sign flips is 10 H is an odd function. So if you flip the sign of the input to 10 H, and the sign of the output, nothing is going to change. And it turns out that this is the only source of non-uniqueness. The architecture, apart from permutations, of course, of nodes, will remain unchanged. So that's the only source of non-uniqueness. And uh, Pfefferman conjectured that you can do away with these genericity conditions. It turns out that uh, there is these conditions have things like linear independence uh, over the rationals and things like this. So uh, some of the elaborate set of conditions. And this is actually something that uh, was just recently established that indeed you can remove all these genericity conditions and you get actually the statement that uh, we have just seen that N1 uh, has the same input output relation as N2, uh, if and only if one network can be obtained from the other by a series of sign flips. Now, uh, this doesn't work for the rail nonlinearity, but because there are big null nets involved, so parts of the network that map to the null function and then you cannot identify them. Uh, but for 10H, uh, it, it does work. And just to, to conclude, give you an idea of how it's done, it actually records, uh, so the 10H has this uh, pose uh, on the imaginary axis. So then if you have linear combination of different 10H functions, you get these different pose sets. And the, the idea is not to give you a proof here, but you start studying then as you go deeper into the network, then clusters of poles form uh, around poles in the previous layer. And then you get very elaborate pole patterns and you study their density in the complex plane. And, and that's actually how the proof works. So the, uh, uh, the mathematical stars that we have visited in this part of the talk are complex analysis, the Bayer category uh, theorem, graph theory, Weil's equidistribution theorem, dynamical system theory, group theory, Lie algebras, Lie groups, representation theory. All right, uh, on that note, I would like to close. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Helmut. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, yeah. Okay, excellent. Thank you, really, thank you so much for a wonderful to tour through uh, various mathematical aspects of uh, deep learning. It was really great. Do we have questions? So we have one question already um, in the physical audience, but please, can I encourage everyone who is online to, um, you know, either raise your hand and then we will call you out to speak or uh, type your question uh, into the chat. But uh, I'll, I'll start with uh, uh, Pierre. Uh, uh, thank you very much for, for a very interesting uh, talk again uh, as, as this morning. Uh, I, I was particularly intrigued by these uh, frame uh, bounds, uh, possible type uh, bounds in the nonlinear case. Mm -hmm. uh, 
could you say a little bit more about this place? Is it does it hold in any sort of limit, and and, and what what are the details there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, of course, uh, by default, I would defer to the paper. It's actually very lengthy and technical. I don't think I have a very good uh, idea in terms of you know giving you a lot of intuition behind these results, but it um, the the shape uh, of the filters um, plays an important role. But it, it and and actually I, I should have mentioned that we work with Sobolev spaces here, so that also plays an important role. So, um, the, the space structure, but uh, other than that, uh, you have to do a lot of grinding, and uh, I fear there is no um, no good intuition uh, that I can give you here. It, it turns out that actually you have to study how the energy decays as you go through the network. And it decays either polynomial or exponentially in, in terms of the depths of the network. And this decay property has to do with uh, analyticity of certain functions. So there's some complex analysis in there. Um, yeah, so it, it's a number of things. And of course, we picked everything so that it, it works uh, and fits together. But, uh, but I agree, the final result is actually something that looks like what you get in the linear case although uh, it's non-linear. So I'm, I'm sorry I cannot give you like the one sentence idea, but uh, I can certainly be happy to send your reference uh, to the paper. Yes, please do, and thank you very much. We're welcome. Great. Are there more questions here in the physical audience? Uh, Helmut, my laptop died, and so I can't see uh, the Zoom. Uh, so Fanny, I think, raised her hand. That's what I can see. So Fanny, do you, do you want to talk? To unmute yeah, yourself yes. Yes. yeah perfect so i just had a question regarding the different function spaces where you say you can um be optimal in this uh, approximation to the extent or um this exponent uh, so so i was wondering if you also uh, get a constructive proofs for how the weights which weights would be non-zero can you see kind of a structure that corresponds to a particular function space. I was just thinking about convolutions, of course, in that sense, like could you uncover for certain types of function spaces, you will get a certain type of structure in the, in the non-zero weights, or um, is there something you can see in your proof? Or yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah, right. So thanks for the question. I was actually afraid you would complain uh, about me having shown Carlos Kleiber, but uh, I'm relieved now that I think I can answer your question. Um, so uh, the, the proof works uh, in, um, uh, via a principle that we call the transference principle. So what we do is we take a dictionary and uh, we try to realize every dictionary element with a neural network. And if that can be done well, uh, quote unquote, and you have a structured dictionary like a wafer dictionary. So let's suppose you can realize the mother wavelet well, uh, then all the other wavelets are realized well because, uh, well, you get them by FN transformations and FN transformations are easily uh, realized. And then the idea is that when you uh, look at these neural network realizations of the dictionary elements, then uh, these dictionary elements should have a property that makes sure that these neural networks don't uh, get out of control in terms of their size. Um, then you put them next to each other, uh, all those participating dictionary elements, you form a linear combination. Each of them uh, is uh, represented by a neural network. Linear combination is again a neural network. You are done. The question that you asked, I guess, is if I understood correctly, is when you go back. So, for example, you have a hypothesis class that has an affine or a Van Heisenberg structure, and you train the network. Will it actually learn a representation? that looks like uh, a dictionary approximation. And I think it's a super interesting question. It's an identification result. We have no proofs about this, but in the, uh, in the paper from, I guess, uh, two years ago with, with Gitta and Philip Gross and Philip Peterson, in the last section, we had simulation results, very, very basic uh, uh, with, with uh, actually richlets. And those results indicate that this may indeed happen but I'm reluctant to say uh, that it, 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 it will happen and under what conditions, I don't know. But uh, if I were to try to prove this, uh, I would try to set it up as a neural network identification result uh, akin to what I presented in the last part of the talk. Uh, but at least these examples, if you look at them, they indicate that indeed the network actually learns the dictionary and then puts everything together. So by learning, you mean if you train it using some method or, or in this case, when you say you simulate? Right. Okay. Yeah, so, so we use gradient descent uh, okay. and, and we picked a very uh, highly structured uh, function class or hypothesis class 
Mm -hmm. um, and and then uh, we got actually the corresponding, I mean, optimal dictionary. All, all I'm saying now is is very strong. So uh, if you just take away uh, 10 dB, uh, then that that's essentially what we did in the paper. And uh, you, you can look at the setup. It's it's somewhat contrived, but uh, I mean that that was our idea at the time to try to see if this indeed happens. Okay, thanks. Sure. Okay, we, we have a question uh, in the chat by Sarah van der Geer. Uh, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question or would you like me to read it out loud? Yeah, so... Yeah, I, I just wondered to what extent does this neural network theory replace dictionary learning or is it... How's the relation? I mean, it seems that they neural networks work for any dictionary. So that's what you're saying, right? Yeah. But what does it mean? <laughs> yeah, right. Good. So thanks for the question. So yeah, thanks. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, uh, of course, there's all this dictionary learning algorithms like uh, LLAT's KSVD algorithm uh, and so on. So we have not tried to compare. Uh, I, I guess this follows up on, on Fanny's question. We have not tried to compare how well neural networks do relative to those classical dictionary learning algorithms. But indeed, the idea is that the universality property tells you that if this identification result is correct, that neural networks, no matter what function class you present them with, and you may not even know what the underlying structure is in the function class, just take functions, throw them into a bag and feed them to a good learning algorithm. If there is structure in the function class, uh, the network will find it and it will find a good dictionary. It would be nice to be able to prove that. I think it's a great project, but uh, yeah, I, I would not say that uh, you know, we compete with dictionary learning algorithms and we can do better or things like this and so on. I wouldn't want to make that kind of statement. Thanks, Helmut. Are there more questions? Uh, oh, yes, th there is one question by uh, uh, Hans Feitinger. So please unmute yourself if, you, if you'd like to. Or I can read it out loud if Hans doesn't want. Okay. So Hans Feichtinger asks, uh, doesn't depend on the amount of data available. There was no discussion of the time and amount of data to be learned, question mark? Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, so there is no, I, as I said in one of the first slides, we uh, say we have a genie uh, training algorithm. We have all the data in the world. This is the best. Uh, uh, you know, you can hope for, and we just look at what is called the expressivity of neural networks. Uh, and that is actually, it's good that you asked me this question, Hans, because I had planned and forgotten in the end to say that we have not visited the universes of optimization theory, uh, actually also not uh, statistics. And uh, this is something that uh, we have not done. There is work by Johannes schmidt heber who has actually looked at regression with neural networks, uh, etc. But uh, learning from a finite number of samples, there is a recent nice paper by Philip Gross and Felix Feuchtländer that actually show if you have finite amounts of data, it's uh, a tall order to get those uh, nice uh, approximation rates that we get. But I think this is just uh, at the beginning and, and there are certain people working on it, but yes, I totally ignored it. So uh, that's why I use the word information theoretic approach. Suppose you have the best possible training algorithm with all the data in the world. Okay, there is another question by uh, Reinhard Heckel. Uh, would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah, okay, uh, happy to. Yeah, yeah so I was wondering uh, the statement on the scattering networks, they were irrespectively of the filters uh, that were learned, and many properties were already um, somehow properties of the network itself. And so, so I was wondering um, is, is a takeaway for practitioners of, of deep learning that the network structure itself is critical for performance and that many important assumptions on the signals that we are um, learning and that we are working with are, are already built in in successful architectures. Yeah, right. So thank you for the question, Reinhard. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so uh, all you need is uh, you need in every given layer uh, the, the filters, the Gs, together with the corresponding extraction filter, the chi, that if you put them all together, they have to form a frame. Um, and, you know, it's very easy to realize frames. Uh, you can draw functions uh, randomly and you get the frame bounds to be bad potentially, but uh, you can get the frame property. Uh, good frame bounds matter actually for energy conservation, as we have seen. Um, 
And indeed, nonlinearities uh, and pooling operators, uh, Lipschitz continuity, but the structure, this tree structure is important. Uh, and that indeed you pick out from each node the output and stack those outputs into your feature vector. So I would say a lot of the properties, that was actually the statement we tried to convey, invariance, covariance, deformation, insensitivity, uh, et cetera, is actually built uh, into this tree structure uh, that you have seen. And the fine details, of course, matter for practical performance, but these fundamental properties you do get already based on, on, the, on the tree structure, provided you satisfy these minimal conditions of having a frame, having Lipschitz nonlinearities and Lipschitz pooling operators. Okay, uh, there is another question by Zoran Ditma. Uh, would you like to unmute yourself? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Perfect. So, um, so that uh, given that we basically now have this uh, recent hype around um, geometric deep learning, um, is uh, the scattering transform simply a subset of that, or um, can we? Uh, yeah, it doesn't have additional value. So it obviously was there first. So, but um, now that we think can think in terms of geometric deep learning is there anything that the uh, uh, scattering transform gives us yeah so if you excuse me can you i mean i i think i've seen the term but i, I wouldn't know exactly geometric deep learning what exactly you mean uh, by that? Uh, the idea is um to um think about the deep learning in terms in terms of um robustness and invariance to or equivariance robustness and invariance to a certain set of um, transformations. For example, um, for convolution, it's um, the transformations that you have uh, shifts. So it's there, it's actually a group. So you want to be equivariant to shifts, and that basically gives you, okay, you should do convolutions. Yeah, okay, no, no, I know. I think I, I knew this, so thank you for clarifying. Great. So what you call equivariance, actually I called covariance, uh, and, and I showed that in image recognition, in face recognition, you want this covariance or equivariance. So I mean, the, the scattering networks have been around for quite some time. Um, I have seen uh, this recent work. I mean, you can see the scattering networks as simply as a feature extractor. It's a mapping, a nonlinear transformation uh, from the input F, uh, to the output. And when it was first put forward by Stefan Mala, he was very interested in this. In particular, he was interested in uh, translation invariance, and he got it by uh, taking uh, the, the, um, the wavelet scale parameter or, or taking the discrete wavelet transform into a continuous wavelet transform. That's how he got shift invariance. And then he proved also deformation uh, robustness, I should say, or, or stability. And then our question that we asked ourselves was, well, uh, under what uh, more general conditions can we retain these properties and potentially uh, get even more? So I, I would say, well, if there is now interest in, in, um, in variances and covariances and, and so on, these uh, scattering networks, they give you certain invariances, they give you equivariance. But if you want a specific invariance, uh, you need to tailor your network to that. And uh, if you use wavelets, then you get uh, a certain set of invariances. If you use Val Heisenberg, you get other sets of invariances, etc. So I would view them as a tool to generate uh, feature mappings from an input to an output. Uh, and uh, if you want to design them so that they have certain invariance properties, you have to tailor them. Um, so in, in that regard, I don't think that one is a subset of the other or something like that, but these are feature transformers. If you look, if you go back to, uh, there was actually in 1964, there is uh, uh, a, I, I think it's an absolutely outstanding paper by uh, Tom Cover, who looked at, uh, I mean, he essentially had found the VC dimension already. He looked at his nonlinear transformations, and I gave the simple example of these two circles here. So he tried to understand uh, how many ways there are to um, classify points uh, with nonlinear transformations, and he characterized them through uh, algebraic varieties and counted their degrees of freedom. So that's how I view uh, scattering networks uh, exactly as such nonlinear transformations uh, in the spirit uh, of Cover. So again, if you don't know that paper, it's Thomas Cover, 1964. Uh, I think it makes for wonderful reading. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, uh, are there any other questions in the audience or in the chat? 
it doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, so with that, I, I'll take over the closing from Carola, who has some technical difficulties with her laptop and, and, and things. But, but uh, we would like to say once again, uh, many thanks uh, to you, Helmut, for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, very interesting and, and, and very inspiring and also very rich uh, in, in terms of the types of results you presented and in terms of the types of maths you used to obtain them. So let's thank Helmut once again. Thank you very much, and uh, hopefully you can visit Cambridge in person next time. Thank you very much to everyone for listening in, and uh, I appreciate it. And I'm so sorry I couldn't be there, but uh, I promise I will make up for it. And the first uh, opportunity arises, uh, I will come in person to the Newton Institute again. Thank you very much, and have a nice evening, uh, and stay healthy and safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.